Hello BookTube, my name is Nathan. Thank you so much for watching. This is my longer discussion video for The Tomb, which is the first Repairman Jack book in the Repairman Jack series by F. Paul Wilson. There are a total of, I forget exactly how many, 22 books, something like that. And my plan for this project is that I'm going to read every single Repairman Jack book, for the most part in publication order. And I'm going to post two videos a week, one shorter discussion, uh, one shorter review video that's going to be spoiler free and then a longer discussion video. So if you've not watched the spoiler free one and, you've, and if you have not read The Tomb, then you might want to go check that out. Otherwise, you are now entering into spoiler territory. So this is, I can't remember if I've read The Tomb once or twice before, uh, but I, I just reread this and it's been a while since I read it, um, since I last read the book. So there's all kinds of things to me that are really, really interesting about the tomb. For one thing, it's an interesting place to start the series because Jack is already a well-established figure by this point. He's got his re repair business going, right? The repairman Jack business. It's well established. He's got his connections in the city. You know, he's got his connection with Abe Grossman and I forget the, the guy's name who does the fake IDs for him. And he's, you can see that he's already accomplished a fair bit and he's got his apartment. He has got his tactics, his strategies figured out of what his role is, what his identity is as Repairman Jack. The other thing too is that he's already met Gia at this point in the series. Um, so this is all kind of taking place in the backstory, but they are on a break or they're just entirely not a couple at the beginning of the book, which changes by the end of it. So like I say, it's an interesting place to start because it's not an origin story. So the first Repairman Jack book is not saying, here are the origins of Repairman Jack, although you do get that a little bit with what happens to his mother. But that leaves a place for Wilson to go with these other books that he's done, where he's got the Repairman Jack Early Years trilogy, um, where he then has the Young Adult trilogy, and then he's got um, some of the short fiction that he's done. It gives him a place to fill in some of those gaps of how did Jack get to this point. But I think that's actually a pretty good place to start a series like this, because an origin story can drag a little bit where you know where it's ultimately going and sometimes as a reader you're you're saying like just get there get to the point where he is completely um you know badass and fully formed and he's this incredible figure um and wilson does that he's starting right where where jack um is well established but and and this is the really interesting thing so he doesn't actually have the reason why the tomb is starting where it does to me is because before this Jack was just an urban mercenary and that he wasn't really participating in this cosmic struggle for earth that he had never experienced anything really supernatural up to this point. You do get a couple references to his youth in the pine barrens and things like that. But for the most part, then He's only dealing with real world events. And that's what the tomb is doing. The tomb is introducing both Jack and you as the reader to this much, much bigger world that's going on all around the secret history of the world that with the Rikoshi and you get the a little bit of references to the old ones before humans were on Earth and, and all of that, that that seems to be why Wilson is starting where he's starting with this book, because this is also part of the adversary cycle. And that was originally how he conceived of the tomb, not that it was going to be its own series, but that it's just a book in the adversary cycle. And so you can see why he's doing that, because that's what's important to him. It's not Jack as a character. Instead, it's all this much, much bigger stuff that's going on. So that's kind of hanging over the whole thing. I want to talk about a few different elements of this, things that really struck out to me. So in the spoiler-free review video, then I did get into some of the some of the elements that are getting combined together because Wilson does not stick within one genre. 
And so you do have a little bit of everything. And for one thing, this is a thriller, and in particular, it's a crime thriller. Now, this took me a little bit to figure out, what does that mean? Because I kept hearing Wilson talk about it being a thriller. You see this within publishing, then uh, editors will talk about thrillers. Now, thrillers in publishing, that has a very different meaning than what a thriller means within Hollywood, within movies. So what that means for a book is that a thriller, as best I understand it, is being told from multiple characters' perspectives. That That's a, a big element to this, that you're not following around just one character. And that's what all of the Jack books are doing. And so the structure of it is interesting because you don't exactly have the same structure that you get in the rest of the books, that it doesn't just have the day of the week and then you've got the numbers within that day. So here are all the things that happen on Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday. Um, in Like he does actually have the day of the week in there, but instead he calls them chapters, which he doesn't do in the rest of the series. So that's an interesting thing. But then each little, um, I don't know, mini chapter within that, um, it's numbered, and then it's focusing on a different character. Now, this is the part that's really interesting to me. He is using a very interesting narrative style, um, narrative point of view, which I have not seen, I have rarely seen it, uh, I have not seen this done very well. Um, at least not as well as what he's doing with this. There's many writers who attempt this style and it's very difficult to capture. Now, the style is, or, or the, the narrative point of view, is third person, limited omniscient, effaced narration. And so let me break that down for you. So it's third person, it's not from Jack's perspective. He's not writing this stuff down. We're not reading Jack's thoughts. So it's a narrator who's outside of the story, third person limited omniscient that within each chapter we're for the most part stuck to the point of view of one character as they navigate through that that part of the story so you get that limited omniscient but then it's also in a faced form of narration so effaced this comes from the french effacé and what that means is it's erased as in, you're trying to hide the fact that you're a narrator, you're not calling attention to yourself as a narrator, and you're trying to really establish your point of the point of view of the character within the book. And so Jack chapters have got Jack's thoughts that come out, but they're not italicized. They're not, he doesn't say Jack thought and then all of Jack's ideas. Instead, he seamlessly, or at least he attempts to seamlessly blend those in with the, with the narration. So you're getting uh, different action descriptions, scene descriptions, but then it also gets blended in with internal monologue of Jack, and then it fl flips back to the narrator's perspective. And so Stephen King does this in many of his books, but what Stephen King does is he italicizes it. So then you know that you're dealing with inner monologue. Um, it's much more effaced in Wilson's books, in Repairman Jack. He's not italicizing it. He's not calling attention to the fact that you're now in Jack's head and you're hearing his thoughts. This has got a lot of strengths, but it's also got some weaknesses. And so when it's done really, really well, it's great. But it can be very hard to capture different voices of different characters. So George R. R. Martin in A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones, he also does this, but he's got much, much longer chapters in which he's doing this. And so you'll have a Tyrion chapter, but it'll go on for, you know, 20 or 30 pages. And then you might have a, a Jamie chapter. And then that could go on for a number of pages. F. Paul Wilson is really quickly switching between them. You're talking anywhere from two to maybe five, six, seven pages, and then you switch, and now you're following a different character's point of view. That ends up making the story go much quicker. It feels like a page turner as a result of that. But the problem, though, is that, or at least the potential problem, is that 
when he's trying to tell the story from a different character's perspective, it's not always easy to capture that point of view. And I think the only time in this book that I really noticed it has to do with the chapters that focus from that focus on Vicky. So I forget exactly how old she is in this, but she's a child. You know, she's she's not very old. Uh, and he tries to capture her inner dialogue, and it's way too um, thoughtful. It's way too reflective. It doesn't match her as a little girl. And I'm going to see if I can find uh, an example of this. Um, you know, it says, you know, this is page 139 of my edition. She's talking about how her dad doesn't care about her. And she says, like, Mommy threw away all his pictures a long time ago, and as time went by, it became harder and harder to see his face in her mind. He hadn't been around at all in two years, and Vicky didn't remember seeing much of him even before that. So why should it hurt to say that Daddy didn't care? Mommy was the only one who really mattered, who really cared, who was always there. Mommy cared, and so did Jack. But now Jack didn't come around anymore either, except for yesterday. Thinking about Jack made her stop crying. When he lifted her up and hugged her yesterday, she'd felt so good inside, warm, and safe. For the short while he'd been in the house yesterday, she hadn't felt afraid. Vicky didn't know what there was to be scared of, but lately she felt afraid all the time, especially at night. So, it's not exactly a, a narrator who's telling us this, although it is, but he's trying to capture the voice of Vicky by saying daddy instead of saying her dad right? That daddy didn't come around anymore. Well, that sounds like it's Vicky's inner monologue and her thoughts. But honestly, what child, like, tell me what child actually does this? What child says, you know, oh, like, daddy doesn't care anymore, but mommy does. And she's the only one who does except Jack. And then when he holds me, I feel warm and safe because I'm scared all the time, but I don't even exactly know what. That is really complex introspection that I do not think a small child is doing. A small child might be feeling those things, but not thinking those things. And so that's where I think it actually would have been better if he wasn't trying to do the efface narration to get into her perspective. That if it was a little bit farther removed from her as a character, I think it would have worked better. With that being said, the rest of it though, he does a really, really good job of capturing all of these different characters thoughts and perspectives whether you're dealing with um, Kasum Bhakti or Kalabadi Bhakti um, whether you're dealing with Gia or I think we get some chapters from Nellie's perspective you get some from Albert Westphalen back in 1857 in these time jumps so he does a good job with all those other characters so I'm not saying that it's a bad strategy I'm just saying that it can be difficult to do that perfectly. And those are just some parts of it that I noticed where he doesn't quite get there. So that's what I mean by it being a thriller. Multiple perspectives, and then that third person, limited omniscient, a face narration. It's also a horror story. Um, it's definitely different subgenres within horror. It's a bit of a creature feature with the Rikoshi, right? And these terrifying monsters, and it seems like they're pretty unstoppable. But you've also got some elements of it being cosmic horror, which is interesting. And so um, I'll try to find, you know, a couple examples of that as well. I mean, you have the one where um, this is Jack and he sees all the Rakoshi in the iron hold of the freighter that Kasum has. And Jack, um, this is from his perspective, it says, Beneath the shock and revulsion that, numbered his, that numbed his mind and froze his body, Jack felt a fierce, instinctive hatred of these things, a sub-rational reaction, like the loathing of a mongoose must feel toward a cobra. Instantaneous enmity. Something in the most remote and primitive corner of his humanity recognized these creatures and knew there could be no truce, no coexistence with them. Yet this inexplicable reaction was overwhelmed by horrid fascination with what he saw. And then it, it continues on with that. But um, you've got this idea that there is something so deep and profoundly wrong with these creatures that it is speaking to this instinctive 
fear that humans have for them, this revulsion towards them. So you get an element of that. You also get an element of that when you're dealing with um, Albert Westphalen and when he's looking at the temple. And so this is um, going back in that, that time jump back to 1857 in Bengal, India. Westphalen wondered how, short of a daguerreotype, um, that's like early forms of photography, he would ever do justice to any description of the temple in the hills. It was simply alien. It looked, it looked as if someone had driven a spike through an ornate block of licorice and left it out in the sun to melt. And then it continues on. But this is Lovecraftian in a sense. It's not exactly Lovecraftian, but to conjure up what I'm trying to get at here, uh, Lovecraft is doing, like, was writing, cosmic horror and cosmic horror is basically the idea that there are such massive terrifying forces that exist in the universe that it would drive you mad it, it would drive rationality from your mind that to even glimpse them it will end up meaning the loss of your sanity that those things are all around us but luckily we are shielded from them for the most part and this is a big thing that comes up within the secret history of the world, the adversary cycle, and within the Repairman Jack books. This idea that there are forces so much bigger than us that are going on all around and that they are very, very difficult to describe. And that's, a, that's an interesting thing to introduce in the series, but it's, it's good to point out that that actually is happening very early on. So you've got horror creature features and you've got some cosmic horror there. You've also got um, an element of conspiracies that comes up because that's, of course, a big part of Wilson's work, especially with the secret history of the world, that there's a whole bunch going on um, that we're just unaware of. And he seems to really enjoy conspiracies um, where you end up getting a book literally called Conspiracies, which has to do with a conspiracy convention. That is uh, book three, book three in the series. So the one that you get in this is that you find out that Kasum, uh, he is behind the death of Gandhi and that he's got this plan to reunite all of, of India back together, um, like India and Pakistan and all of that and bring it back together as one nation. So you get this conspiracy that's going on. You have a fair bit of action, Jack being this, this urban mercenary, um, that he's doing a fair bit, that he is an action hero, but... As, as Wilson points out, he is always working in the interstices of society, that he doesn't have a whole big team helping him. He's not relying on law enforcement, and in fact, he has to hide from law enforcement, but he also has to hide from the bad guys. Um, that he's trying to, to do all of this stuff, but he's trying to do it in a covert way constantly, and that he doesn't have all the benefits that come alongside that. But you do have his relationship with all these other people in the underground, including Abe Grossman, who has got um, Isher Sports Shop. And so where he sells weapons um, behind that, or I think it's in the basement of it. Now, one of the interesting things, and I'm going to do a separate video on this, and Wilson does point this out very directly, that Abe's shop, Isher Sports Shop, is a reference to the weapon shop of Isher, which is a science fiction story by A.E. Von Vogue. Um, I know that I've got it in here. Um, so I've read it before, and I've even had some students read it, um, some, some upper-level high school students read it, and I got them to do a, a short seminar on it, because it's a really, really interesting short story. But I haven't read it in a long time, and I don't know if I actually associated that with Abe's weapon shop either so I will do a separate video on that it'll be basically a bonus video in the series but if you didn't know that then the we the weapon shop of Isher uh, written by A.E. Von Vogt V-O-G-T uh, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Vogue, and that was published in 1951 so I'll see what comes out of that as I read it so you get Abe in there where you have the help um, it's also a bit of a supernatural mystery that you're trying to find out what's going on that you've got all of this backstory that that's happening that you don't know why the why grace and then nelly get kidnapped and then killed what's going on with richard westphalen and then that kasum he's going after vicky so those are all really 
interesting things because you're, you're reading this to try to find out what's going on. The part for me that's so interesting about that is that you're really seeing how Jack, even though he so desperately wants autonomy, that he wants to be his own figure and he doesn't want to be known by anybody, the crazy part of this, and it's the great irony of the series, and, and Wilson has said this, like in those terms, he calls it the great irony of the series, is that because of who Jack is, he actually gets attention on a cosmic scale is now being drawn to him. That because of what he's doing as Repairman Jack, he's able to stay under the radar of the US government, of law enforcement, officialdom in general. But at the same time, he's actually now captured the attention of forces that are so much bigger than the US government. Forces that are so much bigger than something like having a social security number or, you know, registering, like filing taxes with the IRS or having official identity or anything like that, that he's, actually now part of this thing that is much much bigger than himself now that's to me that's an interesting part of this and the way that this comes up in the tomb is that you see that he now this is his first encounter with the supernatural and so this is jack's first time realizing that there is stuff in this world that cannot be explained that there are supernatural figures out there that it, he is not just dealing with the the reality is much more complex than he thought and there's actually a whole bunch more behind the appearance of reality and that's an interesting place like i say to start the series uh, i'm trying to think of what else i wanted to say with this one of the things and this is taking a fairly complex um, approach to the tomb. Now, I've heard, and this is not that long ago, that Wilson has said that he thinks part of the reason that um, Tor McMillan, the massive publisher, has decided not to publish any more Repairman Jack books, he explained it in his Facebook post, but he outlined a whole bunch of different reasons for this, but part of it seems to be because at least he's theorizing Jack is not very woke okay and what he means by this I'm sure I don't think I'm reading too much into this is that Jack being a libertarian is not a far left-wing um, progressive politically minded person that he doesn't care for identity politics because he's actually the antithesis of identity politics he doesn't want to be associated with any one group whatsoever. So Jack is definitely not a woke figure and it sure seems, and I don't think I'm, I'm reading too much into this, but basically within the text itself, then you don't get that kind of perspective in the text. And what I mean by this is that it has to do with the depiction of Kusum Bhakti and Kolabadi Bhakti, the, the twins, are, are they twins or? And in any case, they're brother and sister, that if you're applying the literary theory that Edward Said came up with of Orientalism, and how do we describe ethnic others or others in general? And how has this historically been done within literature, within storytelling in general? And that we tend to, writers have tended to associate really foreign traits to foreigners, that it, it all ends up being this strange otherness. And you get some of this with Kasum and Kolobadi, that you're dealing with, they are, they're keepers of the Rakoshi, and they're part of this group whose job has been for thousands and thousands of years to somehow manage these supernatural creatures but he also does a very good job because he basically he's put in this position where jack and kolabadi they've got this relationship and he's very attracted to her but he's also got this interest in gia at the same time and so what do you do because you got the necklace kolabadi ultimately wants jack to be with her 
when Kusum ends up dying at the end of the book, then she's saying, good, now you can wear the necklace and we can essentially be immortal together or at least live a very, very long life together and uh, I can take you on as a lover. But you don't want to have that. Like, I don't think that this is where, this obviously is not where the series is going. I'm trying to think of how Wilson is conceptualizing of the series. But basically, you have to dispense with Cola Body. Well, how do you do this? Well, you make her gross. You make her monstrous. You make her an other. And one of the ways that you do this, and this seems to be the thing that really just decides it for Jack, that not only does she not really care about the death of her brother, but beyond that, she's had an incestuous relationship with her brother. And then you also get this thing with Kasum, where it's like monstrous and horrifying that he would have sex with the Rakoshi mother in order to breed these half Rakoshi um, beings to then do his his bidding. And that this seems to be this thing that we are supposed to be repulsed by this. And it's just, it's an interesting, uh, this is not a criticism, it's not saying like this is bad, uh, that Wilson is doing this. It's just, it's very interesting the way these people who are the keepers of the Rakoshi, how they get painted in this really monstrous um, depiction through those things, uh, certainly through their bizarre sexual practices. Um, so that's that's just something to, to think about, and you can feel free to comment on that below. But like I say, Edward Said, that's S-A-I-D, it's a very, very famous literary theory, Orientalism, um, and how ethnic others get depicted in literature. So there's that. The other thing that I wanted to point out that I think is a bit of a weakness in the tomb is the way Jack and Kasum are very overtly, we are told, we are not really shown this, we're just told this, that they are so identical. They have got the, they're the same people. They have the, the same outlook or worldview. And I really don't see that. I know that Wilson is insisting upon this, but it doesn't seem to be the same thing whatsoever. Jack absolutely believes in justice. He absolutely um, has got this darkness in him, which shows up multiple times. I mean, this is page 384, where Gia sees Jack, and this is where the darkness takes over him, that violent streak that he's got within him. And it says, she was looking at murder as if death itself had taken human form. That look on Jack's face, she turned away. She couldn't bear it. More rage and fury than any man was meant to hold were concentrated in his eyes. She could almost imagine someone's heart stopping just from looking into those eyes. So you get this. You get this thing of like, Jack has got so much violence in him and so much darkness. And it's like, Kusum is the same way that Kusum is ruthless and brutal when he is avenging this thing. Because certainly what happened with Albert Westphalen and what Westphalen did to um, all of his um, family members, right? To all of the people in the, the temple, the way he killed all of the Rakoshi and then to plunder the temple, that that is of course an awful, horrible, horrible thing to do. And then Kusum is then trying to avenge everyone who's connected with the Westphalen name, all of the, the Westphalen descendants. But that's not Jack. Jack wouldn't do that. I mean, the, the description of Jack, and it's a really, I think it's a great description of him, is that he describes this to Gia very early on. Um, she says, then you're nothing but a hired thug. This is when she finds out that he's repairman Jack. He reddened. I work on my own terms exclusively, and I don't do anything to anybody that they haven't already done to somebody else. I was going to tell you when I thought, and then she continues on, you know, but you hurt people. But this is the important point here, is that he doesn't do anything to anybody that they haven't already done to someone else. That Nellie and Grace Westphalen, Vicky Westphalen, um, even Richard Westphalen, who's not a great guy, but he's certainly not a murderer, that none of them deserve to be murdered. So Jack and Kusum are not the same. And I don't, I do not understand what that is. If that is 
if that's Wilson as a writer, as the narrator, I mean, maybe not him as a writer, but as the narrator of Repairman Jack, is the narrator trying to say that they are the same? Or is this really just coming from Kusum and from Kolobadi? Um, but in any case, it's not true. They're not similar, um, aside from like a very superficial element of they both believe in, you know, revenge and brutal violence um at times but i think that's basically where it ends okay the last aspect that i really wanted to get into you do get the the history of how jack becomes repairman jack and a, a quick reminder here basically you've got this guy um ed who's this younger guy who seems to be a bit of a, a psychopath who really enjoys throwing things off of a freeway overpass onto the cars below and that he's you know of course works his way up to bigger and bigger things he then throws the cinder block it goes through the windshield of the of the car that like jack was in with his mother in the front seat and the passenger seat and his dad's driving lands in his mother's lap she dies the police can do nothing <laughs> it's just it there doesn't even seem seem to be an attempt um that's an interesting thing it's like it seems like they don't even really investigate they're like ah we can't possibly figure this out and i'm like i think they would have done a better job of investigating than just immediately saying like oh, it could have been anybody we're not going to be able to figure this out but i do see what where jack is coming from that he's saying well for one thing they would have a very hard time finding him even if they were trying very hard they would have a difficult time finding him uh, but then beyond that, Jack in general and the entire Repairman Jack series, what it's doing is it's such an interesting thing. It is pointing out all of the gaps in the justice system, saying that the justice system fails in this way, in this way, in this way. Whether you're talking about law enforcement, whether you're talking about the court system, whether you're talking about the prison system, all of these um, different aspects of the justice system in general have huge gaps. And Jack exists because there are gaps in the system. This is certainly a libertarian argument where it's pointing out the, the incompetence of bureaucracy. That there's a certain amount that the bigger government becomes... The more corruption there is, the more duplication there is, the more things that end up falling through the cracks, ironically, right? That you would think that as it gets bigger, that there would be more ways that they could capture people and that justice could be exacted. But instead, it seems to be, no, it just ends up creating more problems than it solves and that it is su there's such a simple solution to solving things like this. And the simple solution is an urban mercenary like Jack who really does exist in those places where the justice system just can't go. And so that's the origin of him. Um, this is going back to when he was a teenager. Now he ends up murdering, um, I, I mean, depending on how you view this, but he ends up killing Ed uh, in a way that seems, you know, fairly um, fitting with how he ends up killing Jack's mother, that, you know, he ties the rope around his legs and then he, he drops him from the overpass and then he's just, you know, <laughs> hitting against the, the tractor trailers as they go underneath. And so afterwards, Jack can't come back from this. Even if he wants to come back from this, he just doesn't seem to know how to do so. So this is page 240, and I think that it's worth going over this section because this is really the origin of him. Jack returned to Rutgers, but college no longer seemed to make any sense. He could sit and laugh and drink with his friends, but he no longer felt a part of them. He was one step removed. He could still see and hear them, but could no longer touch them, as if a glass wall had risen between him and everyone he thought he knew. He searched for a way to make some sense of it all. He went through the existentialist canon, devouring Camus and Sartre and Kierkegaard. Camus seemed to know the questions Jack was asking, but he gave no answers. Jack started flunking courses. He drifted away from his friends. Finally, he saw no point in continuing the charade. He took all his savings and disappeared without telling anyone, including his family, especially his family, where he was going. He moved to New York where he took odd jobs to survive and made contacts, starting getting 
fix-it work with a gradually escalating level of danger and violence. He learned how to pick locks and pick the right gun and ammo for any given situation, how to break into a house and break an arm. He'd been there ever since. Everyone, including his father, blamed the change on the death of his mother. In a very roundabout way, they were right. So the interesting thing is that Jack ends up, because of what he does to Ed, because of what he does to um, avenge the death of his mother and um, actually dispense justice in a way that he felt was fitting, it is, he has essentially crossed this line. He's now entered a realm in which he doesn't seem to find any way to come back. And that's where... He, this is a theme that comes up throughout the series. Gia exists within the ordinary world, uh, the world of officialdom, of, of uh, the traditional world. And Jack is existing literally in the underworld. Um, I mean, maybe not literally, but figuratively in the underworld of the, the city. That he is doing everything under the radar, under the law, um, existing within the black market. And she's constantly trying to pull him back into the ordinary world. And I'm using this language intentionally because if you understand the principles of that um, Joseph Campbell outlines in The Hero's Journey, then basically he explains it as being a circle that, you know, typically what you get in The Hero's Journey is you have the beginning in the ordinary world, the descent into the underworld, and then the ascension back into the ordinary world, but with boons, with gifts as a result of it that you gain, like you become richer for the experience and that you're able to then help the people in the ordinary world. And Jack, like Gia is constantly trying to pull him back up into the ordinary world and Jack just wants to stay down here and it's an interesting question of why he doesn't feel like he can come back from this um, and that, that's a question that I think I want to explore as I continue going through these books is thinking about that of why is it that you know, this one thing happened. Like, would Jack have been Repairman Jack if it weren't for the death of his mother? And because this seems to, this chapter especially, seems to indicate that no, he never would have become Repairman Jack. He would have had an ordinary life if it weren't for the death of his mother. But I don't know if that's actually a consistent thought throughout the series because it also seems to suggest that Jack, he's got this... Um, resistance to tradition he has got this obsession with autonomy with being free with having his own personal liberty and not getting sucked into something that he doesn't want to be a part of that he's such an individual that he just can't he would never be in the real world and so it's hard to square those things i think i'm i'm when i end up getting into the young adult series then I'm really curious to see how that ends up getting explored. So if you've got thoughts on that, on would Repairman Jack have become Repairman Jack if it were not for the death of his mother? Because that seems to be the, the point of that chapter. That seems to be what Jack thinks, that because of the death of his mother, he becomes something else. He can never be a part of society again, um, even if he wanted to be. And I'm curious about that. Is that, is that exactly true? Or would he have somehow ended up being repairman jack to some degree or another even if his mother didn't die because all of those traits within him were already there or were they actually generated with the death of his mother and with the killing of ed is is that where they got their origin or was that there uh, was that in him to begin with uh prior to that so those are some of my thoughts on the tomb i've got lots more that I could talk about, but I'm sure that's uh, plenty. And like I say, feel free to comment below on your thoughts about this um, and any other points that points of interest that you might have about it. And then the next book is Legacies. So I'm going to post the short spoiler free review of Legacies tomorrow. And then the longer discussion video of it will get posted uh, the following Thursday. So next Thursday. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.